So hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Gina Turnage and I am part of the Hypothesis team. It's great to see so many attendees and we really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us today. And I have the pleasure of introducing our pre presenters for this session from Florida State University. Please welcome David King, Andrea Hodge, uh, Omar Arslan, and Joe Ryder who will be leading this session, which is entitled Enhancing Collaborative Learning in Business Education at Florida State University, big mouthful. So I'm gonna mute and let our presenters take it away. Hi, my name's Dave King and I'm uh, really glad to lead uh, off with my colleagues here at Florida State University. We have a mix of established and rather newer instructors and also the people that help us teach in online classes. Uh, so I'll start. I believe in um, like experiential learning. Uh, so I was in the military and uh, it was kind of tell people how to do things, show people how to do things, and then have them do it themselves. And hypothesis allows doing that all in one assignment. So you're able to have them have a reading, read it, something that tells them that you can have uh, instructors make annotations in that, show them kind of what you're looking for and how to expand and apply the information. And then you can have the students do it themselves. So it helps the students engage in the reading. So you, we often assign readings and the students don't always do it or we don't know that they do it. And with hypothesis and putting assignments embedded in the reading, you know that they access the readings. And then the students help co-create the meaning and are active learners in the process. So an example of uh, an assignment that I have is that I'll write instructions and ask them to make annotations using a hypothesis in a reading. Usually it's a PDF from Harvard Business Review. And then I require them to have three responses. One would be a response to something I've made an annotation on and asked kind of a question. And then I ask them to make an original one and then they also respond to another student. So a conversation develops over the reading. It doesn't have to be very long. Uh, typically assign it into about uh, two different groups of about 30 for a 60 person online class. And then this is an example. Uh, the highlight is of something I highlighted in a PDF reading, talking about alliance failure rates. And then I'd make a post or an annotation on the side that's viewable to all students and then ask them to provide examples or other things. Uh, so this is an example of why I use it uh, and how it can be used. And then I was going to switch it off now to Andrea. Well, I'm Andrea Hodge, and I'm a strategy doctoral student at Florida State University, which means that I'm a little bit newer to teaching college courses, but I bring a lot of excitement with me about trying new methods of making the classroom more engaging. Uh, so one of the courses I teach involves a business simulation, and it's a really excellent opportunity for students to formulate and implement, implement strategy. So, you know, each week we go through and we learn a new type of strategy, and then the students have to come up with a plan for implementing that strategy in the simulation. So they're putting their learning into practice. And so this team-based, project-based learning, you know, it has its pros and cons. So they get to practice their collaboration skills and their problem solving. It's a form of experiential learning. And usually the students are pretty motivated and engaged, um, but sometimes they're not. Occasionally we have students who are happy to let others do most of the work and to take as much credit as they can. And then there's also the issue of like, we're working on the same project together. How do we all con contribute to the same document? So there's the coordination of things. And then as an instructor, I also want to know who is contributing what, who has put an effort into the assignment. And so let's go to the next slide. So hypothesis has really been a uh, solution to this. Um, this is an example of one of the assignments that I use hypothesis for, and this is really just a chunk of the assignment. This is, um, this is a strategy formulation assignment. So what I have the students do in their uh, learning teams is they read through the assignment and the various objectives of the things that they need to come up with as a team, their strategy formulation. They talk together about how they want to formulate their strategy, and then as a team, they kind of 
figure out how who's going to do what in terms of writing up the strategy uh, plan. And they kind of use the hypothesis assignment in order to kind of write everything down. Um, so here you can see this is like a piece of a document that I would have available for social annotation. I make the gray boxes so that students know that when they want to see my feedback, that's where they're going to find it. And then I just have the empty lines as place where the students will put their contributions. And I'm very specific about exactly what I'm looking for for each part. I feel like when it comes to writing out a strategic plan or anything like that, you have to be very specific. Um, and then once the students have made a contribution, they can see that it's done. Um, and we can go to the next one. So hypothesis really provides a great solution in this case. Um, I create these interactive documents using like this layout for a specific strategic strategy formulation plan, but I can also use it for other things like readings or websites or videos. And I love making the interactive documents as well because like Dave said, sometimes it's nice to have um, examples or reminders. I like to leave hints for the students in the footnotes just in case they've forgotten a key term. Um, and it's really great because the students can see what their peers have written in their teams. They can see like what's done. And then I can see who did what. And then it's great that it's integrated with our system, our LMS Canvas, because I can go through and I can grade each person's contribution to the strategic plan or any other strategy formulation assignment. And then I can head off to the next crew. And so as Andrea mentioned, I will talk a little bit about um, the Canvas integration site, but I would like to introduce myself first. My name is Omar and I work as an instructional technologies technologist, which means that I work with our amazing faculty members here in the college and I provide mostly technology, pedagogy and design related support. And my educational background is in instructional systems and learning technologies. I recently earned my doctoral degree from Florida State University. And during my doctoral program, I mostly focused on learning interactions in online courses, especially in higher education contexts, which um, gives me some ideas about um, how hypothesis affords learning interactions in online courses, especially. So hypothesis affords multiple different learning interactions, including learner instructor, learner learner, and learner content interactions. And as Andrea mentioned, these are these are my drive. Um, So Dave, I'm not able to see our, okay. There we go. The previous one. Okay. I, ha I have one more thing here about why hypothesis. So as Andrea and David mentioned, hypothesis affords visible learning interactions, um, which makes these interactions a little bit more visual um, as students interact with the content. And now we can talk about how instructors set up assignments in Canvas. And next slide. So I'm not going to cover each and every mouse clicks when setting up an assignment on Canvas, but I will highlight the most important steps. Um, as you can see, we need to select external tool here under assignment settings on Canvas as the submission type. And then we need to click on find button here, which will open up configure external tool dialog box. 
And as Andrea mentioned, Hypothesis is available here at Florida State University, and we select Hypothesis as the external tool and click on Select button here, which will open up the um, Assignment Content dialog box. In our next slide, I have a screenshot about it as well. So Dave, if you can, um, for the next slide, yes. So this is what um, Hypothesis displays when we click on the Select button. And there are multiple different assignment content that we can select. If, if it will be a PDF file, it is important that it is an accessible document um, so that students are selecting the content in these files. So this is, um, again, I'm not covering each and every mouse clicks here, but these are the most important and maybe unique steps uh, when we integrate hypothesis in Canvas. And now Joe will talk a little bit more about um, stuff. Just stuff. Just stuff. Yes. Just stuff. Yeah, I guess next time. Okay, that's me. Yeah. All right, um, I'm Joe Ryder. I am the uh, director of program manager for the academic tech team here at the College of Business. Uh, basically, we do what Omar said we do. We work with faculty and sometimes staff, helping them with their courses, um, from troubleshooting, why isn't my Canvas doing what I want it to do, to more pedagogical, how do I you know, make my class more interactive, what's a good idea for this assignment, or I have this idea, how do we make it a reality? Uh, I didn't add this to the slide, I apologize. Uh, before that, I worked as an instructional designer with uh, various departments in the state of Florida, and I did some work uh, creating content for K through 12 students here, or also at the state of Florida. So I, I've done a lot of work within the ID field, which is, it's an experience. Um, so when it comes for, or, coming into this position and coming from being an ID, I was always focused on authoring tools. So, okay, I'm building what I need to build. I'm either using something like Captivate or I, mm -hmm. I know they changed the name of it. Forgive me, I don't remember it. Or Storyline or Rise or something along those lines. And now that I'm in this position, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what tools do we have available to us that can help our faculty members do what they need to do? So I'm not worried about, oh, I need to create a video. I'll hop into you know, Adobe Premiere, make it there, and then hope I can implement it to wherever it needs to go. Now it's like, okay, what can we do to help our faculty? And this is more of a high level view of some things we look at. Obviously, we look at price because if we're going to be spending money on this, we want to make sure that A, it's feasible, and B, that it's going to be used. Um, so like I said, what we do in the College of Business, we help faculty. Um, amongst the entire university as a whole, there is something called the Office of Digital Learning. And what they do is they do what we do, but for everybody. And they tend to have a lot of licenses and tools and stuff. And they merged with their IT department and they're doing an audit of all the different tools, what's available, and who's using it. And if there's tools that are just saying they're not being used, they're going to get the old heave-ho. So we got to make sure whatever tool we choose that it's going to work for as many people as we can. Uh, then we're going to look at integration. And I think what's been really interesting, what Omar's gone over, what Andre has gone over, what Dave's gone over, is you've seen there's a lot of flexibility with this uh, tool. And the more flexible it is, we use it for different iterations and different applications. But it can be frustrating sometimes. And this is in case with Hypothesis, because you'll have a tool and they'll promise you the world for it. And then you get it and it it might not integrate into Canvas. It might not integrate or whatever your LMS is. It might not integrate the way you want it to. So then you're having to twist it and bend it to fit what you want it to do. And then you end up coming to Omar and I'd be like, hey, it doesn't work. Why isn't it working? And I'm like, well, you know, but anyways. So that's something we take into consideration too. We also take into consideration ease of use. Mm -hmm. How does it I mean, how does it implement, but how do the end users use it? How, you know, if the faculty members are using it, is it going to be repeatable from semester to semester? Is it easy to set up? Is it going to cause them trouble later on down the line for the students? Is it easy for them to interact with? So they're not, you know, talking to the faculty members saying, hey, I don't know what's going on with this. I tried to do this thing. It's not working. Help. 
And then the faculty member says, hey, I don't know what's going on. They're trying to do this. It's not working. Help. And then we say, uh, sure, we'll do the best we can. So she's trying to make it a nice, seamless, easy process. But also, back to the money thing, if it isn't easy to use, no one's going to use it. And then your university or college or whoever spend money that they didn't spend money on. And then um, I guess the last thing that we tend to concern ourselves with when looking at tools is just how, you know, how effective it is. How does it work for everyone? Does it accomplish the goals that they need to have accomplished? And, you know, is it going to be something that we can keep using and using and using and everyone is happy with? So that's basically it. Just ease of use integration and just making sure that it works because as you all probably know, you know, there are as many tools to choose from for educational purposes as there are stars and night skies. So trying to find those right stars is always really important. So that's me. And we have Trevor. Thank you. Uh, so we wanted to provide some background on the different people. We have people that are using it in classroom. We have people that are helping us using the classroom. And we wanted to open it up for questions to in case people wanted to ask about how we're applying it or how they could apply it. And I apologize, I posted the wrong link. So the correct link is there now. And then you got to see on my Google Drive while we we're at it. So <laughs> all right. So Andrea, how did you learn about hypothesis? I mean, as a new instructor, where what well, I think I think I'm kind of always looking out for new ways to get students involved with things. Um I can't say that I can remember exactly how I found out about hypothesis, but I know that I was looking for a good solution. I knew what I wanted to do with that assignment with the um, strategy formulation and teams, but I couldn't quite figure out how to do it. And I think I started off using a different tool and then I tried hypothesis and I was like, oh no, this is gonna work. This is, this is the right fit. Um, but I feel like I'm kind of, I'm kind of always trying different things to see what'll work. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that my students are patient with me and willing to try a new a new type of assignment because that that ended up being a great way to do it. Right, excellent. We do have a question. So it's how do you change your workflow to use hypothesis in your courses, if at all? So I'll, I'll try it first. And then Andrea, if you, you want to think about and try to have an answer. Uh, so I'd used uh, discussion posts and like, uh, short multiple choice quizzes, and uh, those weren't super meaningful. The students didn't answer the, really the questions. They didn't uh, use the resources from uh, the book typically. So all the stuff that you put in uh, the PDFs is not something that can go to Quizlet or some external source. And then they have to actually look at the material, consider it, go to an external source to be able to do it. And it's all integrated seamlessly and uh, Canvas, it was easy to read. It was a lot easier to grade than like discussion posts. And it was, you put a rubric on it and then it's, you know, they do one post annotation, two annotations, three annotations, and then where they proficiently developed. It's really quick to grade and students like it. Andrea, did you have something to add on the workflow? Yeah, I would say that for me, for me, it's not a big difference in time. It doesn't take me that long to create an interactive document. And the grading between um, grading with a discussion board versus grading with hypothesis, it's a very similar layout. You can you can look at you can either look at everyone's post all at the same time. You can look at them by team. I think you can even grade by team, which is very nice. Um, and I think there's a with Canvas, there's some slight functionality differences when you're working with teams. So I appreciate that functionality. Um, it might even be slightly, like slightly faster for me to do it this way because, um, because putting it into the discussion board format requires breaking things up. And I think it's better for the students too, because they can see everything in one place. They know exactly where to go if they're, and the way that I set up my assignments, they're somewhat cumulative. And so I expect my students to go back and look at the things that they wrote before and it's a little bit easier for them with the discussion boards to know, okay, this is where we talked about this plan. This is how we were going to do our international strategy. This was how we were going to do our pricing strategy. Like this was, 
you know, they know exactly where to go to find their answers. And then we have two related questions on uh, the assignments and how they're spread out in the grading. Uh, so I do spread out multiple annotated readings so students get used to it over the semester. Uh, so I, the course I primarily use it in has two halves. The front half is more learning the background and the second half is more applied. And then I have readings from Harvard's Business Review that are more applied. So I have four of those. And it turns out that hypothesis and those annotations, like kind of like a discussion board, but more interactive and dealing with the material where students co-create the meaning is 25% uh, of the course grade. And then how would you use it in your grading? So I don't know. I'd have to go back and look, especially since these are like group assignments. They're not a huge portion of the grade, um, but they are, are they are important. Do you um, use them multiple times or is it just part of? Oh, yes. No, we would use them every week. We would have one of these um, strategy formulation assignments every week because it was how the students were applying what they were learning from the lectures. Excellent. And then uh, Omar or Joe, did you have something to add on how the grading works? Or have you seen or had questions from instructors on how to do that? Um, not really, but I think um, to Andrea's point, it is, I think, nice to see all students' annotations when grading, I think, which makes it more efficient for the instructors. Um, th that is something that I noticed when I was looking at the a speed grader portion of Canvas. So um, that, might that might help when grading as well. Yeah, so we use Canvas and you're right, once that assignment is set up, which is you showed how to do in the slides, and then I kind of showed how to type up the instructions and you load the PDF is that the students make the annotations and then speed grader in Canvas or shows the individual student annotations. And then you can also then show the conversation but what I do is just grade the, in my case, three student annotations. And it's really easy to see what that student did and what their contribution was and be able to evaluate it. I just realized there's something that I do that I don't know if a lot of other instructors do either. Like the way that I have my, my things set up, I have them broken into parts. And so where I put my comments, I also give them feedback on each part. Um, and so I like that as an instructor, when I'm giving feedback to students, instead of giving them one big block of like feedback, I can like say like this right here, this right here was really well done. Or it's like, I would have liked you to see, I would have liked to see more of this brought in right here. Um, this could be improved. And again, because these assignments are cumulative, they are going to have to come back and fix those things at, at their end of the semester project. So that's a good point. Yeah, my assignments aren't cumulative, but they're recurring and I can give feedback on the early annotations. And you see that all students essentially do better as the annotations go on because they're able to all see their other students and what they're putting in the letter of effort and the amount of detail. They're seeing the comments that you can provide them as feedback what they could do better. And then over time, it becomes a really good conversation and tool to be able to discuss the material for a course. And the students are helping again, cre create that meaning. And it helps the engagement of the students and also with the material and how it applies. It's a really powerful tool. Uh, we have only about five minutes left. Hopefully the people that posted questions and I appreciate that we answered those. If you'd let us know if you have uh, potential follow-up questions. There's one more. I try to focus on flipped classroom where folks need to do the reading and then come to discuss. I'm thinking I thought this could drive a conversation. Yeah, so I primarily use it in an online class. Um, so I haven't used it in a traditional classroom, but you can use it as a flipped classroom to make sure that the students read the reading before you go and you can see some of the students' comments and maybe the questions they had about the material and then use that to spend more quality time in the class. For me online, it, uh, it's already, I guess, all online and flipped. So I mostly uh, put some of the content in the comments to the students and then you can send up a weekly summary of the important ideas that were from the week. How about you, Andrea? Have you, you use it in a in an actual classroom? Well, so that approach, the, whenever I do the simulation, it's a bit like a flipped classroom because they do need to do the readings before they come to class. 
And I did allow them to use the social annotations. I didn't grade them because I wasn't sure how they might use them. I was hoping that they would find a way to, um, what I had hoped to see is that students who were in teams together would identify like key parts of the readings for other members of the team to kind of like pay attention to so that there would be a little bit of collaborative learning. When you're not grading it, they're not gonna do anything with it. <laughs> so I guess the trick is to be very specific about how you want the students to be interacting with the readings. And I, Hypothesis is really flexible to be able to do that. You can point things out in the reading that you want students to focus on. You can create questions that they have to respond to. You can ask them to comment on things that they don't understand or think are interesting. And then as part of a kind of a traditional classroom where it's flipped is that you can have that all done before class so you know that the students have done the reading and then you can use that to kind of design the class discussion for that day so you're spending time on what students think are interesting or what they're struggling with or on the assignments and the collaboration or the reading and the application of that material so hypothesis is a really useful tool and you're really only going to be limited by your imagination of how to get the students to engage better with the readings using this any other kind of final comments from you, Andrea or Joe and Omar? Um, to that point, Dave, maybe um, Hypothesis has a resources page as well. And there are some different assignments in different courses, which may give some more ideas about designing learning activities. It, it's excellent point. And I'll put that now in the chat. And I have the right link this time, so. <laughs> yeah, so I really appreciate the people that participated today. It, it's kind of awkward where we're just the panelists are visible to each other, but it's obvious there's a couple dozen people involved in the conversation with us, and we really appreciate it. And uh, hope you're able to use hypothesis and make your classes better. And thank you to all the panelists for your time, for your insights, and for sharing how you're using social annotation in your courses or in your content.